five minutes. I'm like, okay, it has to. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm delighted to welcome you all at Lois 8th Educational Webinar. On behalf of Lois team, I would like to thank you all for your constant support and willingness to contribute to our effort to bring more efficiency to legal pros' lives. You're amazing. I am glad to spend this morning in the company of such an active political community. You are definitely at the right place if you want to know how to show your worth to your team, if you seek how to become more skilled and productive, or if you, even if you consider going solo. And I would like to ask our audience to write in our live chat how many years have you been working as a paralegal? So please feel free to drop a message in uh, uh, comments and we will answer your questions. Um, okay, so before we start, I want to briefly present you to our product, uh, you, to our, you, you to our product lawyer. Lawyer is an AI-powered software for efficient contract review and drafting in Microsoft Word. If your law office is looking for a way to speed up contract review, and boost the overall efficiency, drop us a line. We will be happy to show you around the product and address all questions in a 15 minutes call. Because it will time, meet, let's meet in a call. So now it's, now it's time to start. And uh, first of all, welcome our fantastic speakers. Holly Sheriff, founding member of Best Virtual Paralegal, president and, at New York City Paralegal Association, and award-winning litigation paralegal, entrepreneur, business paralegal coach, motivation speaker, author with 31 years of paralegal and marketing experience. Nice to meet you, Holly. Hi, thanks for inviting me today. I'm excited. And, yeah. Thanks. And uh, let's meet also Ada Rosa, freelance paralegal, legal career development coach, author, and a co-host of two popular um, podcasts, Everyday, um, sorry, sorry for that, Everyday Law with Ada Rosa and Let's Talk Paralegal with Ada Rosa. With 18 years of professional uh, excellence in the legal professional, Ada Rosa has been uh, distinguished by the Inner Circle magazine and given appreciation awards by Broward College and Sheridan High, Tech High School. Um, nice to meet you, Ada. Hi, thank you for having me. A pleasure being in such company. So I'm, I'm looking forward to what's happening. <laughs> Yeah, it's such a pleasure to see you here with us today. We can't wait to learn more from your valuable tips. Um, and before we start, actually, I would like to tell you how we're going to proceed. So the first part of the webinar will be dedicated to the questions that we had on our website. Uh, and the second part of the webinar will, will be dedicated to um, answering questions from the audience that we have in our live chat. And one more important thing that the author of the most outstanding question will walk away today with a $100 Amazon certificate and one year uh, free subscription with lawyer. So please ask Yay. actively and get a chance to get the prize. <laughs> so good luck. <laughs> yeah, nice. Um, so the first question, um, the first what we're going to discuss is I believe that nowadays efficiency plays a big role in career development. And the more effective you are, the faster you develop professionally and personally. So Holly, Ada, uh, what does an efficient workflow of a paralegal look like? It, Holly, can you please start? Uh, yeah. It really, it really depends on the area of law, really, and how you work the best. AI is really the thing right now and paralegals need to get comfortable with technology and computers. 31 years ago, when I started working with lawyers, we had a typewriter and a cup of coffee and a pencil <laughs> in our hair. That's, that's how we worked. That's not, that's not how it is anymore. So you need to find your groove with technology. That's, that's key. And what works best for a lawyer may not work best for the paralegal. And as the team, you have to talk about that. You have to have hot conversations. That's 
honest, open, and two-way. That's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I agree with you on that last one, um, Holly, about being team. You know, there's no I in team, so a lot of teamwork. Yep. Um, I, I have a, a whole spiel that I always give my paralegals that I coach. It's there's a difference between a next step meeting and an actual strategy meeting, right? So when you grab the caseload yeah. and, and when you grab the new case, you have to create a process, you have to create yep. a strategy and no cases alike. So that also helps you with the efficiency. Um, also yep. learning, learning a lot about your software of what the actual software that the actual company offers. And I'm not mm -hmm. just talking about your caseload management software. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the phone system, the email system, every software that that you know company includes, right. you know every in, every out of those types of softwares, and it will really, really uh, help you be more efficient as a paralegal. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. That is the bottom line. So, actually, if we are talking about um, the legal tech, we are talking not just about um, some software for. Um, fixing some some issues, but we're talking also about email providers and all this stuff, right? Yes, yep. exactly. Um, also with the West laws of the world and the, and the LexisNexis, really know every single software that your company has to offer. That's the first thing that I do when I do my process development for the law firms. I ask them for a list of every software that they have, whether it's Office 365, whether it's LexisNexis, Westlaw, Nextiva for phones, every single software that they have on in their possession, memberships, whatever they have available to them. That's the first thing I ask for is mm -hmm. what type of software do you have already to see if we can just use what you already have versus canceling all of that and getting another software and investing so much money on something that's unnecessary uh, at times. Sometimes you're, the software that you already have it is workable you know for for what you need um you just need to learn how to do it and that goes for attorneys as well this is not just for paralegals i mean attorneys need to know what they purchased and how to use it and all the ins and outs because if they're not being efficient then how is their paralegal going to be any more efficient um if we're not all on the same page again that whole strategy conversation versus you know the next step kind of thing great thank you and um, this, the second question, I think, uh, actually, you two have an impressive uh, experience as paralegals. Um, and I think what things do successful paralegals, um, what things do successful paralegals should do on a daily basis? Hmm. Hmm. Go ahead, Holly. <laughs> Man. Okay, well, sorry, not sorry, but don't practice law, no independent <laughs> legal judgment, no. And you have to understand what that means. It depends on where you're at. There are no hypotheticals, don't, don't do that. You need to know your boundaries, bottom line. You need to know your boundaries. And you need to understand that we're, we're an extension of the lawyer Think of it as an umbrella. We're the handle on that umbrella. The lawyer and everything else is the actual shoot. And once you understand that, everything else falls in place. Or it should. And you yeah, need to be um, confident every day. <laughs> confident. Uh, yeah, I, I think learning about yourself is the first step yep. you need to know in order to be efficient, know your daily tasks and everything else. There's a lot of uh, communication that goes along with it. When I first started, I just had a sociology degree under my belt. I didn't have a paralegal certificate. I wasn't certified in anything um, as far as that goes. You know, now there's so many certifications and licenses mm -hmm. that a paralegal can have. And of course, you know, let's address the elephant in the room. Of course, we don't do UPL, which is unlawful practice of law. But that's changing as well. So, you know, Arizona, Montana, they're having limited licenses and things like that. So if you're within those types of jurisdiction, mm -hmm. please yeah. don't take what we're about to say into that context. That has nothing to do with those limited licenses. And please look and review 
at those specifics right. um, as far as right. that limited licensing goes. So right. we're just going to address that because I know there might be other people that I, this is most likely nationwide. And I know that there's some people in Montana and Arizona that are like, well, wait, no, we can, we can practice to a certain extent, which yes, you're right. If you're under that license umbrella, absolutely. Um, we're just talking about just you know, the average paralegal, either with a certificate or not, or just has oh, been, wow. you know, being a paralegal in in the, you know, the spectrum, right? In the normal, in the normality of it all. Um, so as far as that goes, um, there is no limit. Uh, a paralegal should be able to do everything from intake process to answering the phone calls mm -hmm. to um, going to the, you know, printing documents, prepping for trial, discovery. A, a true paralegal should know every aspect that there is in order to obtain the best outcome for the mm -hmm. client. That's what a paralegal is. Uh, we no longer divide ourselves, especially if you're with a sole practitioner, you're everything. You're the receptionist, right. you're the legal assistant, you're the paralegal, you're right. the investigator, you're the customer service person. So as far as that goes, you are everything. Um, and you should be. Uh, don't ever think that because you have 18, I saw somebody that had 21 years of experience in the, in the comment section. Don't ever think that that is beneath you. Customer service is what right is the heartbeat of the law firm. And that's what drives no clients, no business, no law firm, no job. That's simple math there. Right. So, you know, it, you thinking that it's beneath you answering a phone call, you're not in the right profession. Um, you know, it, it, right. it, customer service is the most important, is what drives the business. After all, this is a business, you know, and as freelance paralegals, we see that differently um, when it comes to a business and when it comes to running a business, right? And we see the stressors that it comes to owning that. So really realizing and understanding all the intricacies of what goes into the actual process of your law firm is super important and necessary. It should be learned at day one with or without training. You should be walking around the office. What do you do? What are your responsibilities? How can I help you? You should be that person, be that proactive yep. person because you have to take it upon yourself to understand how the law firm works, who are the players in the game. And because now you're joining that team. I, I think that that's how our, our profession was built. Yes. I think that's <laughs> how it kind of evolved from the 31 years ago when I started, we, did shorthand we we did i had to learn how to walk and talk with the lawyer at the courthouse literally holding all the stuff and taking notes <laughs> and sewing his pants up at the same time i mean it just yeah. it happens yeah and i think we have to be that person i kind of like to think of it as an executive assistant type of role. Love it. You have to wear all of those hats sometimes at the same time. Yeah. Nothing's the, beneath you. Yeah. And the <laughs> one thing that can show your worth is to make yourself part of the bottom line. Yeah. And you have to up those skills. I mean, yeah. if you lose out on doing something for the firm because you think it's beneath you, then you're losing out on learning something new, learning technology, learning yeah. the system, the process. These are steps that you can take in order to really go up that ladder and go on your own eventually. So, you know, yeah. every little step in the process, I kind of like to think of it as the, um, industrial area you know era when when there was yeah. like a factory and every person had an intricate part in it in order to build this massive car or product in general and that's really yeah. how a law firm works like every piece of the process is imperative um in order to really really get that outcome that the client and the law firm has set so right 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 absolutely well, it's clear what to do, and definitely thanks for such an insightful um, answers. And I think my question is logical. Uh, what would you advise not to do, and what things should a uh, successful political avoid? Uh, <laughs> Holly, can you please start? 
avoid saying, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> avoid saying, I'm not going to do that. If they want you to do it and it's not practicing law, do it. Learn how to do it. Um, and Okay. So really, there's only one thing we shouldn't do. And that's practice law have independent legal thought as a traditional paralegal. If you're a legal tech or one of those other specialty limited licensed paralegals, you can do whatever your license says you can do. But if you're a traditional in-house or freelance paralegal in the United States, you know, we need to be supervised by a lawyer. So we cannot practice law or make legal judgment about a case. And we can't do it even if a lawyer asks us to. Little story. I had a lawyer. He was a new lawyer. He called me up and said, can you help my brother? My brother has a DUI in Indiana. My first question to the lawyer was, are you licensed in Indiana? He's like, no, but you're a freelancer. You work in Indiana. I'm like, yeah, but only for lawyers. He goes, oh. So the lawyers don't even really understand sometimes what we do. So you need to understand what you do. The yeah, lawyer. there's a paralegal ethics also that you mm -hmm. guys can look at. It's online. NALA, uh, the National Association of Legal Assistants, yep. has it on their website. So you can go to NALA, N A L A dot org, and they literally have the paralegal ethics uh, oath that we take once we get certified. Um, we also have to abide by the lawyer's oath as well. So look at your yep. jurisdiction, whether you're in Florida, you know, um, Montana, Arizona, whatever state you're in. Look at the yep. oaths that the attorneys um, have to take. That's also a nice little roadmap for you to know the do's and the don'ts. Um, exactly. Aside from the obvious that Holly said, obviously not practicing law or anything outside of what you're licensed in, I would say bad customer service. Again, that whole customer service, I don't care if you're having a bad day. I don't care if that client is being rude to you or that caller is being right. rude to you. It's not your job to return the favor, aka, and I'm being funny about that. Um, you know, it's your job to protect the integrity of the law firm. Again, you're representing a whole team. You're, you're the face of that lawyer and you're putting that lawyer's license in jeopardy by providing bad customer service. Yeah. So and not just the face of the lawyer, the face of the whole industry. Yeah. You know, I mean, look, Hollywood hasn't done a great job at portraying the legal industry. Let's not add to it. Okay, guys. I mean, yeah. we have to be, you know, we have to be cognizant of that and we have to be understanding. Look, we all have bad days. Yeah. We all wake up at the wrong side of the bed. One yeah. rule that I always have ever since I, I hit my 30s a couple years ago, I'm not going to grade myself. But um, ever since I hit my 30s was don't take stuff personal. It's not you. Yeah, like not. people wake up, people have bad days, like relax. And if you're that person like me, I'm a short, like, oh man, I'm, a, you know, a firecracker. Like I will go from zero to a hundred and like nothing. I am like that. I'm a hothead. I know I am. What I do is I hit pause. I just put them on hold for a second, walk away, take a breath, kind of like gain my, you know, reality back and be like, it's not me, remind myself and then be like, thank you for holding so much. I greatly appreciate it. I'm so sorry to hear that you're, you know, you're having this bad experience. Is there anything I can do to improve it? Like, and you know, at the end of the day, we all have to offer customer service and it doesn't matter what kind of day, what kind of attitude the other person is providing you. That communication factor goes for everyone, not just the client, not just the caller, your attorney, your attorney's stressed out. They have to pay all these people. They got to find the money to pay them. They got to run a business and practice law. Like that's not easy. Um, you know, and they have personal stuff going on. They're probably have, you know, personal issues, health issues. Guys, you yeah. never know what these people are going through. So putting the human back in humanity is like essential. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely with you, agree with you that uh, customer experience really matters. And I think it's not just about um, the paralegals. I think it's in all industries that we are facing. Um, and yeah, thanks yeah. for, I, I absolutely agree with your um, ideas. Yeah. And in your opinion, what skills should a person have to stay relevant as a paralegal? 
it, again, <laughs> technology. I'm, I keep going back to that technology thing. But when I started my company, uh, our whole mission was to reinvent the way attorneys and paralegals work together. And technology was at the heart of that. Yes. Now, of course, I did start my company with a typewriter with the broken E key. Yes. <laughs> and went door to door and had people slam doors in my face. I it happens. That. And the name of my company, Best Virtual Paralegal, people laughed. I almost threw that name in the trash mm. <laughs> because people laughed. It's, you have to get over all of that and embrace technology. I just had a student yesterday tell me, I hate computers. I hate learning computers. She's in her mid forties and she wants to be a paralegal. And I'm like, you have to get over that fear of technology. You need to embrace technology and be confident. Lawyers want us to be confident. Yeah. Even well, if it's an illusion. <laughs> Even if it's an illusion. Aside from technology, of course, uh, communication. I'm going to hit on yeah. communication. Um, I'm yes. a sociology major. Uh, so I literally, the study of society, that's my whole thesis was the study of society. So learning how yeah. to communicate with people that are not like-minded, that... Um, Again, we have to understand that the people that we serve, because it's a service that we provide, the people that we serve yeah. have no idea what is going on, what right. to expect. They right. are flustered. Obviously, they're going through something, right? Uh, whether it's a car accident, a family issue, a contract issue. However, you know, whatever practice right. you guys practice in, if it's federal appellate, there's no, there's no big or small uh, right. case for me anyway, because everything is big for the client. Right. So it's probably their first time. They have no idea what law is. Obviously, that's why they're going to the attorneys and the legal industry in general. Um, it probably was not expected, super unexpected, most likely, depending on what side you're on. And so understanding that they're already at a place in their mind where they're frustrated and stressed. And that's something that I think we can all relate to. Like, that's not, I don't think anybody here, yeah. you know, uh, has never been under stress. And if you have, you know, private message me, please, because I would love to know the secret. Um, so, right. you know, we all have these underlining things and we have to understand that communication is the key to everything. That's everything we do, whether it's verbal, whether it's written when we're drafting an email, a pleading, um, a text message, because now we're texting clients, you know, making sure that our grammar and our spell check and all that's in place. All of these little things um, really add up. And, and really, again, create that customer experience, setting those expectations, knowing that the client can count on us in their time of need is literally our only job. Mm -hmm. That's our job. Understanding, our job to make sure. understanding the client's journey yes. from exception to conclusion or yeah. whatever, that that's really our job. Yeah. Is to understand the client journey from when they step in the door to when they, when their case is over. Absolutely. And um, another skill that I learned along my trajectory of my entire career is if there is no process, create a process because it will not only help you as a paralegal with the whole case management part of your job, but it will also help the firm. Um, a nice way of doing presenting something like that is, hey, I'm really behind. We're missing deadlines. I see these type of issues, highlight the problems, but then provide them solutions. I had a great manager for a very long time, for five years, which was towards the tail end of my nine to five career. And I, as a person, he may not have been the best, but he was a great manager. And he would always tell us, thank you for providing me the problem. Can you provide me some solutions? 
be that solution person. Hey, yeah. we're having issues with this phone system, but I made all this research and I have a couple of other people that are recommending this type of service. And I think this is really beneficial for us. Here's the pricing, here's the coordinator, here's the person, here's the yep. software, here's this. Be that person. If there's a bottleneck somewhere in the firm, the attorney that's all the way up here is not gonna know. They're not gonna know all these problems. They're up here. They just want their cases done and they want their money in the bank. OK, so understanding that they don't understand the operations of it all because they're really busy being what they're really good at, being a lawyer and doing the research and doing everything that they need to do in order to get their client, you know, satisfaction and, and get the money in the bank and, and keep this, you know, business going. They're they're up here. You know, they see reports. They see numbers. They don't see software glitches, yeah. uh, something missing in the process. That's your job. Your job is to be that person, is to be like, hey, there's a problem. Here are some examples. Here are some solutions. And, and the only thing I can add to that, because that's a really great point, is when you are the solution person, make it very simple. State the problem. Give them three solutions. One is the best fix. One is the middle fix. And one is... Short term. Yeah, short term kind of on the cheap end of the solutions. And you tell them which one would work the best for the whole team, not just you. Not just you. And, mm -hmm. and not just them, but the whole team and the clients. Show them the client benefit. Right. Yeah. And presenting it in a way it's digestible, right? So at this mm -hmm. point, you understand your your attorney, you should understand your attorney and the way they communicate, the way they like to get communicated. I've had attorneys from all sides of the spectrum where they just wanted me to text them because they were always out yeah. in trials and mediations. So that was the easiest way to communicate with them. So I would text them. But I've had a lot of attorneys that like that in-person interaction and that they would bring me into their office and we would have full-on conversations. So really depending on how your attorney likes to communicate in general that's the way you should yeah. be delivering these um these solutions yeah yep. i absolutely agree with you that all this is about providing value to the customer to the client to your colleagues and to employers and my next question would be how can a paralegal show his words to an attorney mm. nice one yeah that's a good one <laughs> So I, I think um, being part of the bottom line, taking ownership in your own value and the firm's value of what we do for the clients. I mean, bottom line is we can't be, we can be paralegals, but we, most of us need a lawyer to be a paralegal it's not the other way around lawyers can be lawyers without paralegals so show your worth by stepping up to the plate and you know just be that go-to person uh be yeah. the know-it-all i mean at this point that will be your best bet to yeah. be that know-it-all to know hey i can fix that oh i know how to do that oh i can do this and if you yeah. don't Go home on your own time and learn it, learn yep. how to do it, learn how that software works. Again, educating yourself, always keep learning. Learning doesn't stop at the classroom. Um, right. So you really, you need to understand that knowing everything about every little lick, every little thing will provide that value to the, to the law firm and understanding your attorney, the way they work, how they like their work product, what they want how they want it, when they want it. You, The attorney should never be giving you a directive unless it's a one-off case. By that time, you should already know that they usually like their extensions on discovery. Okay, automatic. I already drafted the extension. Do you want do you want to submit it to the, case, to, the, to the court or are we going to hold off on it on this one? Hey, I already drafted your deposition summary. It's already done. Your deposition's in two weeks. Do you want this now or do you want it later? You should be that person carrying yep. the case because all they need to do is practice law, provide you with the strategy, and then you take it on and run with it. That's uh, yeah, that, and that's our job is to execute the strategy. 
that's our yeah we execute it they provide it to us and of course when you're on -on one-on-one with your attorney you can throw your strategy as well but that doesn't go outside that room you know like you're not giving it to the client you're just saying hey this client really likes you know i don't think he's a good witness i don't think we should put him on the stand you're that's something you're gonna know way better than the attorney because you're communicating with that client on a day-to-day basis week-to-week basis you're you you know the ins and outs you know that background story of that client i've done that plenty of times where i'm like i don't think this is a good client for to put on a witness stand they get really nervous they were diagnosed with anxiety so they're not going to do very well in deposition do you think we can do some settlement things before you know it gets to that point maybe we can start having some conversations with opposing counsel being that person and being that partner because that's really what you are. You're their partner. You're there to right. help them. You're there to support them. You're there to be that, you know, that team member that they need because they're not going to be able to do it all. Although some of them swear they can. Um, it, it really gets to the point where their caseload gets to too much. Like I get that all the time, especially with the sole practitioners where they don't have the supporting staff necessary in order to carry the caseload. So that's really where a good process, a good team member, all those things have to, you know, be taken into consideration. And you should be that good team member. You should be that person really understanding the attorney and the strategies and how they work and how they communicate. Getting to know your attorney is essential for success. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing this. And we all know that the world is changing and um, the technology is influencing the uh, legal world as well. And my question is, is being a tech savvy necessary for being successful as a paralegal? And if yes, in what technology is a must for a poly- paralegal? Well, Holly's uh, been hitting home on this one, so go for it, girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I think it's knowing what software works the best for your type of lawyer. I don't agree with these lawyers that purchase the biggest and the best uh, case management systems. You don't need all the bells and whistles. That's the problem with technology is it gets fluffed and then you get lost in all these apps when really sometimes it's as simple as make sure your email's secure and just communicate a nice easy way right so it's understanding how you work the best it's not what's the best technology solution it's understanding how the team works within all that technology. And Not how many everybody... players are in the game, right? Because if yeah. it's just you and an attorney, right, and there's no reception, there's nobody else, you don't need the bells and whistles for two people, guys. It doesn't right. matter how big the caseload is. Right. Um, right. So the like... caseload is going to be what the caseload is going to be. <laughs> yeah. That's never going to change. But if it's still just two people running the show, you don't really need much. Um, But again, learning and educating yourselves on these different types of technology is always beneficial for you guys. Uh, Learning these uh, text messaging softwares and these um, what they call the e-phone systems, right? Where there's not like an actual phone, like the phone is actually on your computer. Learning that that Mm -hmm. even exists, because I know a lot of paralegals that don't even know that exists. Um, so knowing all the software that is out there or the type of software, not like, I'm not talking about individuals like softwares and I'm not going to name any because I'm not sponsoring and nobody's paying me for this. So I'm not going to name any softwares, but any caseload management software, which we all know all the legal research software, all these softwares that are out there, you don't have to learn every single little one. What you do have to know is that they're out there, what they're called, how they're used and what their purpose is. That's what you need to know. Right. Because I see a lot of attorneys and paralegals get lost in the fluff. Yes. And then the workflows, regardless how many workflow processes we've set up in whatever software we use, they still have that same problem. Right. Deadlines 
being lost, the work not getting done. So it's time to keep it simple. Yeah. Go back to the basics, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, uh, the, the other issue that I know is that usually legal professionals uh, can have a bunch of software, like three to four different solutions that help them uh, uh, solve the same problem. Have you ever faced the same issue? I have that in my office right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's the invention that. of integration. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's where integration came from, right? So we can in integrate all these softwares yeah. together. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot of caseload management softwares out there that do email and do you know text messaging and yeah. do all of these things, templates and all this like. Um, I, I worked with a really awesome software the other day because they used me as a test dummy. And so I was testing it out. I'm like, this is phenomenal. And so I'm like, this does everything. So you can have that one side, you know, that one software that does the bulk of your, you know, of the work. But then you have like Office 365. So wait, so are we using Office 365 or are we using our caseload management software that has a whole email system, you know, like, yeah. so, it, and, and has right. like, commu you know, intercommunication and it has everything yeah. that Office 365 has um, and it can integrate with everything. And, you know, so I think again, like Holly and I were hitting home a little uh, earlier in the conversation, um, knowing what your software actually does and the purpose of your software can eliminate all of that. And um, and understanding what the firm actually needs, really, to be honest with you, I think that's probably the first step. Yeah, yeah I, all these attorneys and even paralegals think we need some kind of big practice management and we all need to work in the same system. We don't all need to work in the same system. I don't work in any of my lawyer's system. <laughs> they, they work in mine. Yeah, that's right. They work in mine because that's my office. That's my office on the web. Yeah. So, I mean, we're freelancers too. It's a little different, but yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's kind of like figure out what the problems are the software is supposed to solve for right. you. Yeah. And, and understanding then, the needs. Yeah. And then pick the best solution for that. And remember that the software isn't to replace us. It's to enhance us. Mm -hmm. Assist us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's to enhance us. Um, great. Thanks for sharing these. And we have previously talked about uh, a little bit about, um, a lot of different tasks and that the paralegal has to do pretty much all job, uh, starting from communicating with the client, uh, helping uh, attorneys and um, doing working a lot of with contracts. Um, and it all provokes a lot of stress. And my question is how to deal with stress. Maybe you have some tips. I think really a paralegal needs to practice a little mindfulness and even some meditation hit that mute button on your phone and zen yourself down a little even if it's in the middle of the conversation <laughs> because you need a break from the emotion no matter what kind of case walks in the door whether it's a contract review or a criminal case or a family case. It is all emotional driven because it's a problem caused by people. Yeah. But and I need to add to people. what Holly is saying, learning your triggers, learning yep. what triggers you. Um, we yep. all have past traumas of some sort, whether they're yep. super dramatic, right? Physical, mental, whatever it is, we all have past traumas. Um, we are, again, if you don't hit me up, I need to know the secret. Um, so understanding yourself first and yep. why you feel that certain way to certain situations, why you think your boss is X, Y, and Z, why you think this client, oh my God, he's so difficult. 
you know, why asking yourself and understanding yourself, why you're reacting that way and why your actions are towards that person so much uh, can go a long way. So um, I do a lot of uh, professional development for law firms and I do this yep. exercise. I literally, uh, well, back in the day when I was physically in the room, I would go around the room and I would say, all right, we're going to have an, a, a, an A group and we're going to have a B group. I don't tell them anything else. I go around, I whisper in everybody's ear what group they're in, right? And I go, all right, guys, if I said you were in the A group, please, um, please stand up. And normally nobody does, nobody stands up. But while I'm doing that, they're already saying, oh, you must be the B group. Oh, you must be the A group. Oh, you must be the B group, right? I'm not putting any labels on the group, but they're already identifying themselves. They're already prejudging right. themselves. So right. a lot of times our prejudgment is internal, right? Like I didn't label it. I didn't put any color. I didn't put that one's a paralegal, one's an assistant, yep. one's an attorney, one's this, but they're already like, oh, you must be the A group because we're like the best. We're the A team. You know, <laughs> I'm already seeing that atmosphere. When in the end, there is no A and there is no B. It's just to give them that realization that we ourselves prejudge. We ourselves have internal unconscious biases. So understanding that you have those biases, regardless yeah. if you're not, and I'm not talking about racism. I'm not talking about, you know, certain types of personalities. That, that all goes out the door. We already have prejudgments of people as soon as they walk in the door. Uh -huh. We already are like, oh, man, she's going to be trouble. Oh, she's loud. She's Hispanic. She's going to be trouble. I get that all the time. But that's fine. I, you know, I, I understand that those are pre-biases, pre-judgments that we get, you know, loud and proud and this and that. A lot of people have all these pre-judgments and pre-biases. Again, do not take it personal, but understand your triggers. That's what you need to understand. You can't control others, but you can control yourself. Yep. Yeah, thank you for this and absolutely agree with you. Um, and again, you too, Holly, and that you have impressive experience as paralegal. Maybe you can give some uh, advices on how to become a freelance paralegal from where to start and what to expect. Um, I think that don't start the way I started. <laughs> <laughs> don't start the way I, I did. did. <laughs> don't do what I did. Um, when I started freelancing, I didn't actually even know that's what I was doing. Oh, okay. <laughs> 31 years ago, I started working for lawyers because one of them asked me if I knew how to type. Hmm. And I wasn't his employee. I was a 1099 person. A year later, a lawyer that I was an employee for, he was like, you know, you've been freelancing for Joe. I'm like, no, I haven't. I just type for him every once in a while. So I didn't even know, right? Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. Have five years or more of experience working as a traditional employee inside a law firm or remotely that relationship is different. The lawyers don't expect you to have all the answers when you're an employee. They would like you to, but it's not necessarily expected. When, when we're freelancers, they expect us to be the, ex, the loud expert in the room. They want to be able to just dump their files on us and they don't want to train us. So if you're not confident and you don't have that experience, I wouldn't recommend freelancing. But it's not impossible with the right law firm and shadow someone who freelances. Shadow a senior freelancer and ask them, an informational interview, have an inter an informational interview with another freelancer 
that's more seasoned than you to really find out if that's really what you want to do. Because at the end of the day, you're starting your own business, whether you know it or not. Um, okay. I I have a little different take and please, Holly, don't get mad at me. Um, <laughs> I just say to grow your network. So I, you know, a couple of things. Yeah. So I say once you grow your network um, and I'm talking about not just paralegals, I'm talking about in and out of the industry. So mm -hmm. I have 18 years of experience. I had 15 when I went freelancing. So of course, like Holly said, I had plenty of experience. I knew the, the lingo and everything else. But I know freelance paralegals that had zero experience, went straight from paralegal studies program, straight to freelancing and are doing just fine. Um, because there's different ways of freelancing paralegal services. So I always say the legal terminology is it depends. So if you're just going to freelance your paralegal services, as far as legal research, drafting, providing caseload management, right. if you're going to just focus on that aspect of being a freelance paralegal, then absolutely. I'm with Holly shadow somebody, learn your way. It doesn't have to take five years. I know people that learned it in a year. So depending on your capacity and your legal skills, I'm not going to put a time limit on it. Everybody learns different. Everybody grasps information different. So I never like to say one to five years or five to 10 years, because I know paralegals that have been paralegals for 21 years and still don't even know what legal research is. So that's not like time frames for me do not exist. Um, I feel like that has a lot to do with society as well as women. You got to be, you know, after 35, you're done. You can't have kids. That's kind of like my interpretation of it. But again, we can agree to disagree. Yeah, um, we're going to disagree all of, on that. <laughs> that's fine. Um, it's just my intake. Um, and then aside from growing your network, learning your, your ways, learning how to do this, again, like Holly said, and I completely agree with her on that one, is you're a business owner now. So learning yep. how to run a business, what that entails, learning about taxes, what that is, what is the best tax bracket for you, learning all that, sitting down with CPAs, sitting down with all these people. And the reason why I hit home with networking is that's how I started. Thanks to my network, I was able to grab a client in less than two weeks from opening up my LLC. So, and then after that, another month passed and I got another client, but that's because I had already established a very strong network. Um, rewind from that is I never burn a bridge. I build bridges. I don't burn them. So even if I'm leaving or even if they dropped me, right, fired me or whatever, I never left on a bad note. I always left respectfully, gracefully, regardless of the situation, because my last employer wasn't the nicest one. And I still left with grace. So depending on um, your situation as well, right? So I'm a, I'm a bridge builder. I don't burn them. But again, that's me. Everybody's different. Another thing is gut and persistence because it's easy to give up. It's harder to keep going. So if this is something that you really want to do, you have to remind yourself that this is something you really want to do. Yeah. Being a business owner is not easy at all. You have to be the all hats wearer. If you think you're doing everything now at your law firm, you're not even dealing with human resource, taxes, payroll. You're not dealing with any of that. You're just sitting there doing all your legal stuff, but you're not dealing with all the other stuff that comes with managing a business, right? AKA law firm. So understanding that it's not easy, but that you don't have to give up, that you can be persistent and continue to move forward that's amazing. Uh -huh. For those that are, are looking into doing this and are, um, and one thing that I will tell you is like Holly said, learn the basics, learn your substance. Um, you're not going to know it all. I still don't know it all. I'm not going to say I'm a know it all, but if I don't know it, I learn it. I take a course, uh, community college, they offer those one-off classes where you don't have to pay for the entire degree. You can just take that one course. So I had an attorney that asked me for immigration, something I've never done, something I never wanted to. But since I had this long term relationship with this client, both personal and professional, I understood the necessity that they needed. And I understood why they came to me knowing that I had no immigration experience. However, we combined our forces and I went to their continuing legal education under their license. I went to that class. I also went to a community college and took an immigration course. So just because you don't know it doesn't mean you can't learn it. 
um, and understanding your strengths, right? Um, understanding that uh, maybe you don't know it all because you're not, it's not going to happen. You're never, ever going to learn it all. I've been doing real estate law for 18 years. That was my first law that I ever, that I ever did. And I still don't know it all because laws change. Procedures and rules change. Technology changes. Every judge is different. Every jurisdiction is different because I offer my services nationwide. So there is no way possible that I'm going to know every little thing about real estate law in all 50 states. So understanding that you're not going to know it all, but that it, understanding that there is a strategy when it comes to like civil litigation, understanding the foundation of civil litigation, because civil litigation is the same. doesn't matter. If it's family law, it doesn't matter if it's personal injury, you have your complaint, you have a response, you have your discovery, and then you have a trial or settlement. That's never going to change. Okay. <laughs> so understanding the foundation of civil litigation is pretty much what you need to know. And then you add all the, the ins and outs of it, depending on what type of practice you're doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Holly, Ada, thank you so much for such an insightful discussion today and for answering all of those uh, questions. As far as I can see, we also have several questions from the audience. Um, so the first question that we have is from Jillian. Uh, is being a, success, uh, being a paralegal, I feel I'm constantly living in the future with deadlines, hearings, trial dates, etc. What sort of advice would you offer on how to handle um, what is in front of you at the moment? Hmm. So, so what do you think of that? It goes again with the strategy meeting. Yeah. Understanding from the intake process, from when that client comes in, understanding what the necessities are for that particular case yeah. is really going to help you with the deadlines and the hearings. And understanding what your attorney wants from that case will keep you on top of everything. Yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I can't even say it any better. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> yeah. And the next question is, what's the best way to let an attorney know uh, that the way they are doing something based uh, on just not experience, but the MPEP is not the correct way? Mm. Holly? <laughs> Personally? <laughs> Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> I would just say you're wrong. <laughs> and here's why. And bullet point why. And if they say do it their way, okay. And, and it depends on what wrong it is. So if it's yeah. like unethical, right? Or if they're doing yeah. something that is outside the ethics. Um, I would just say no and walk away or do what yeah. you need to do in order to not get yourself into that situation. Now, if it's not something illegal or unethical or, you know, walk in that gray line and it's just right. most likely procedure, maybe they misread a rule or they misread a procedure or, you know, something to do with deadline or, or, or something very procedural, right? Something yeah. that's not mm -hmm. like as... I you know, intense. As I think I have a, a perfect <laughs> scenario for this question. Um, I have a client, a, a family law client hmm. in a certain state. She needed to serve another person in another state. I went to her and I said, I read the rules. It says we need an affidavit. I've drafted an affidavit for the special process server to sign once he serves our guy and she says that's not how i interpret it i'm like okay my affidavit's gonna sit right here three weeks later i get an email that says holly the clerk says our service is bad we don't have an affidavit what is she talking about and i had to say remember <laughs> The affidavit, the service has to sign. Sometimes they need to see that they're doing it wrong to know that they're wrong. And you just and, and the, those conversations to have to be in writing. Those, yeah. you know, um, just to protect yourself. Everything yeah. is CYA, especially if you're a licensed paralegal. 
you have to protect your license as well and your certifications. And when you're a freelancer and you have your own business and your own LLC, of course, we have our liability insurance and we have all that, you know, all that stuff that will protect us. But protecting yourself first and not having to go through that route and providing, you know, documentations and having these conversations electronically um, will be useful as well. Again, depending yeah. on the situation. Okay, so we also have other questions. Um, so do you have any tips for navigating the evolving job market? I see more paralegals accepting virtual position because there are more opportunities available within this flexibility. I think you need to understand what value you bring to the table and understand the best way to present that for the position you want. And that entails reading the descriptions of the jobs before you apply for them. And don't just settle just because you need a job. Decide what job you want and look for that. And for those of you that are job seeking for paralegals, there are different ways of job descriptions and job postings. It's not just paralegal. Some attorneys yep. still call them legal assistants, depending on their age. Um, they call them legal assistants. Uh, they call them caseload managers, project yep. managers. Um, there's a lot of other labels that they place upon the paralegal job description. So like Holly said, really be uh, very specific as far as what your job description says. If that's something that you yep. actually want to do, then yeah, go for it, whether it's virtual or not. But before you do all of that, actually know what you want to do. Because I know a lot yeah, of paralegals yeah. that just like just start don't. applying and have no clue what they actually want to do yep. what law firm they want to work for do your research as well yeah. on these law firms make sure that these attorneys are licensed in the state that they're sending their license well, to um that see where they graduated what you were saying about networking you yeah. really need to check with your network when you see a a, a position that you think you want go to linkedin first linkedin and i we have a checkered past. We were not, I was not a fan for a long time. Then the <laughs> pandemic hit and all of a sudden I am a fan. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of like check with your network. See yeah. who knows someone. Every Maybe they've firm, worked there before. Yeah. You know, yeah, what, what is the environment firm, like? I have all ever, that good stuff. Every client I've ever had, every law firm I've ever worked with. I have checked my colleagues and my networking list. I've always ended up knowing someone that knew someone that knew someone that had already worked there. Absolutely. Um, so it's really find out what that law firm is all about and will you fit the room? Make sure you fit the room before you try to apply. What are you talking about, Holly? I fit any room. Excuse you. Yeah. <laughs> the, the work culture is kind of more important nowadays. I'm kidding. The work culture is kind of more important nowadays. Absolutely. Yes, and and great. it's a family. You're joining yeah. a family. You're joining yeah. a family. So it's kind of like marrying into a family for yeah. those unmarried people out there. It's pretty yeah. weird when you think about marriage, these two complete strangers getting together and now they're going to be permanently or whatever X amount of years spending yeah. the holidays together and spending these, you know, events together. So think of that. I know this is a weird one, but think of it in that same concept your complete stranger is walking into this law firm and you're trying to get along, right? So not yeah. everybody's going to get along. We all have that crazy aunt, that crazy cousin. We all have those, you know, people that are off the wall. We all have those introverts and extroverts. So you're going to have a little bit of everything. Um, that's basically what, you know, life is about. And so getting comfortable with the uncomfortable is really going to help you as well. Yep. Yeah, and the next question that we have is from Carrie. Uh, what is the best way to communicate with a difficult lawyer uh, with a little time to give? Yeah. Well, that kind of goes with why are they difficult? I think we touched upon <laughs> yeah. this earlier, right? Yeah. Why are they difficult for you? What is triggering you from that person that's making you think yep. that that lawyer is difficult? So understanding what's triggering you first 
why you think that person is difficult um, is going to alleviate that. Understanding how they communicate. Again, learn how they like to communicate. Learn what you can and cannot say how. Because it's not just about what you're saying, it's how you're saying it. Yeah. Man, did you take one of my courses before <laughs> this webinar? No, I have an amazing one of my books. I have I have an amazing <laughs> business coach. She is phenomenal, but she also does mindfulness and mindset yep. and all that because I was not if you would have met me five years ago, I would have not said half of the things I just said right now. Um, I was a completely different person. I was, like I said, I'm, I'm a hothead. I'm Latina. We're loud. We're proud. We talk with our hands. We're always ready for a fight. We're taking off our earrings. So um, I think being the, on that go mode and on yeah. top of that, I'm an A personality. I'm a perfectionist. I'm a business owner. I'm a mom of toddlers. You know, adding all that to it um, really can change somebody. And, and and learning how to communicate with different types of personalities is crucial. It's just I crucial. think that the best way to communicate with a difficult lawyer with little time is listen. Speak less, listen more. And it's body language. It is eyeball rolls. It's the words that they're not saying and be that solution don't add to the problem be the solution so thank you for all the questions that we have today and for such an such great discussion uh i think it's time to pick the best questions we had today can you please show us the list uh just a second which question did you like the most? Mm, man. Oh, wow. They're really good. Hold on. <laughs> yeah. Oh. oh, man. As a paralegal, I like them all. As a career coach, I like the job market question. Yeah, me too. I'm with you on that one, the job market one. I think that was more intuitive. Yeah. Um, so would you please contact us at uh, on lawyer at, on, okay, sorry for that. So can you please uh, contact us uh, on our email, which is support at lawyer.com. We need your data and email to send you a gift. Um, you want today $100 Amazon gift card and one year subscription with lawyer. And actually, it's a pity to know that um, our webinar is going to the end. And um, thank, thank you for all for visiting our webinar today. And tomorrow we will send you the link to the recording and other valuable materials in the follow-up email. Um, thanks so much for your time. And we also want to invite you to Lawyers Legal Productivity Club on LinkedIn. It's a great place for legal professionals who want to be more productive and effective in their professional and personal life. There we'll discuss everything related to task optimization, professional productivity, effectiveness, and work-life balance in the legal area. We moderate every post to keep our community clean of anything that doesn't provide value. Um, this is pretty much it. And thanks for your time. It's time to end our webinar. Uh, but I want you to invite to our next webinar, which is gonna, which gonna take place on the 28th of October. And we'll have the honor to chat with Olivia Visachera and Angela Hahn about self-care and work efficiency tips for being a productive lawyer. And have a great evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us and uh, for such an insightful talk today. Goodbye. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.